Good afternoon uh, from Malaga, Spain. Uh, we are at the Horasis Global India Business Meet, and I have with me uh, some very distinguished people uh, representing uh, core sectors of the Indian economy. Uh, Mr. Salil Singhal from PI Industries, Mr. Mittal, also chairing as the CII president, and Mr. Call, who has been a veteran and old timer at Horasis. Uh, the interesting part is, you know, uh, the world is looking to and asking a very interesting question once again, even though the numbers have been out there for quite some time, about the Indian economy and its five trillion milestone. And uh, it, this becomes even more uh, relevant because in the past six months we've seen some disruptive knee-jerk reactions around the world uh, with trade barriers coming up and some uh, walls that are being created, so to say, in the short term. And, and so this becomes even more important that how is India as, as an economy and an engine of growth for the world is looking at its own individual very clear mandate of going five and ten trillion economy. And, uh, and what you gentlemen feel, being the leaders of the industry and leading policy matters, uh, are where we stand truly. Uh, what impediments we might be facing, and uh, what interventions, if, if required, uh, would you suggest to everyone out there to make this happen? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with Mr. Mitho. Please go ahead and uh, tell us some <coughs> of your thoughts on this. Well, I think um, uh, it's, a, it's a very relevant question to ask. First of all, uh, um, you know, post-economic meltdown of 2008, for the first time after a very, very long time, we are seeing synchronized global economy growth. U.S. is growing, U.K., Europe, emerging nations, developed nations. You pick up any data point, all of them are moving in the, in the uh, positive direction. Amongst the entire global growth which we are seeing, India stands out as a shining star, having exited March 18 at a 6.7% GDP growth. And by any projections, whether it's the internal projections of the CII, the government of India, uh, uh, <clears throat> multilateral agencies, IMF, World Bank, we are looking at 7.3 to 7.7 percent uh, GDP growth this year. And uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the economic front, uh, I can share with you that uh, the past two, three years, uh, econ economy growth had slowed down, especially on the, on the industry manufacturing side. And that happened on the back of uh, bad monsoons, droughts. Then we had two big uh, policy, big bang policy reforms, demonetization and, uh, and the GST. Correct. Uh, but what I'm uh, <clears throat> very happy to see, and this is the sentiment which I picked up from my uh, business uh, friends and business community, that most of these sectors have revived. They have come back. Today, if you look at the auto sector, commercial vehicles and two-wheelers two are at all-time high. Tractors, they are peaked on demand. Uh, in fact, major auto companies are booking advanced steel capacity for the next three years. Uh, I'm just giving you the, 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 the you know, visibility into how the economy is moving. On the back of public expenditure, uh, 25, 27 kilometers of roads and highways every day being, being built up, steel cement is doing very well. Uh, consumer non-durables, FMCG, services. So all these sectors are firing. Barring, I would say, the two sectors where we, we, have, we still have uh, some challenges on the capital good industry and the real estate, the reality sector. Um, I was very happy when I, I saw that in April, May this, this year, almost 50,000 crores of CapEx has been announced by major corporates. And <clears throat> as we now see more and more capacity utilization, which was uh, struggling at about 75 watt percent, has moved to 83, 84. Uh, on the back of huge rural, rural demand, R rural consumption has gone up uh, because of good monsoons. The next monsoon pr projection by the Med Department is very good. So this is all what we are seeing uh, on, on the growth pattern. The last quarter GDP, uh, the, the, the growth has been at 7.5%. So clearly, we are moving at a much faster pace, and we will continue to be the largest uh, <clears throat> growth, GDP growth economy in the world. We'll, we'll be leading the pack ahead of China also. Today, we are at $2.6 trillion economy. Last year, we added about $300 million on the, on the, on the GDP. 
if, if it is business as usual, by 2025, we will be a $5 trillion economy, for sure. My view is we may <coughs> achieve that even earlier, given uh, uh, the, the, the latest projections uh, and, the, and the statements by the finance minister where he's talking about getting into double-digit growth next year. That will hasten up the process. But not only that, by 2030, India will be a $10 trillion, trillion economy. That's, the, that's, that's a given. I mean, I don't think anything can stop that. The two challenges which I personally see... That would be very interesting to know. I mean, you, you talked so well about all these nice things. Yeah. But what are the two challenges so two, that two you believe? Two big challenges which India is facing today, one is on the rising protectionism. Mm -hmm. uh, as we are seeing more and more developed countries, the Western world is talking of, uh, of bringing in artificial trade barriers. Uh, which, we, which I personally thought would only be posturing is now getting into action. Uh, you are seeing the trade wars between US-China, US-India, US and other countries. The other countries have started uh, responding or uh, uh, retaliating, if I may say. So that is one big uh, challenge which the entire global economy will see. Having said that, I also believe that one, on the other hand, when I'm seeing the growth happening globally, the export opportunities for India open up. Probably, maybe it will be uh, stifled a bit with the U.S., but then there are other countries which will open up. And I believe India will be playing a major role in the Commonwealth block of uh, countries, 53 nations, uh, where the uh, current uh, the, uh, the, the trade is at about $560 million. Uh, billion dollars. Uh, they have a projection from $700 billion to a trillion dollar within, by, by 2020. And out of that... Uh, services is going to lead the pack, and that's where India's strength comes in. The second challenge is on the rising uh, crude, crude oil prices. Thankfully, uh, U.S. shale uh, gas and, uh, and oil supplies to India, which have started coming in, have come at a lower pricing than what we have been importing from neighboring countries. So to me, that's a bit of a good thing which I see, which can mitigate to some extent. So these are the two, I would say, uh, Big challenges so we need uh, for to be the keeping Indian an eye on. Yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Mittal. I'll come back to you with a question that is embedded as part of what you said, uh, especially on the uh, what people would like to hear. And since we are from the industry, is these numbers that GDP numbers that are spewed out in the um, out there in the market, uh, whether it is a 6.9 or a 7.2 because in the last few years, there has been a recalibration in the way we measure GDP. I would definitely like one of you or all of you to, uh, to clarify that point very, very clearly that the numbers that we see are the numbers we have. Because fundamentally, if there is a little lack of confidence in the numbers that people see, then it, it creates a little bit of an uncertainty of FUD factor. Sure. So maybe that question could be for later in the second round. Uh, now I'll go to uh, Mr. Single, PI Industries. Uh, you just heard Mr. Mittal share his thoughts mm -hmm. where we are. I mean, uh, what would be your input? Well, I think I'll straight get about to the subject of uh, the possible impediments uh, because uh, you have heard the story and uh, I fully endorse that and in fact, uh, irrespective of the statistical challenge of their accuracy. Nobody can dispute the fact that India is on the march, and it's on one hell of a march. So things are moving. There is a lot of expectations. The entire political system has, in fact, geared itself to get the economy going, because the, the, the people who now elect them have become very conscious of the possibilities of what they can achieve if politically given the right leadership. So in that context, uh, the numbers are one part, but the very fact that the whole process will now have to be driven by leaders who are committed to development is to me a very, very important positive factor. Having said that, I think one of the key challenges India faces is to set its agricultural house in order. We have phenomenal wealth. We have phenomenal options. Um, on my personal basis, 45 years with the, in the connected to agriculture, India could be the breadbasket of India, given its weather conditions, its variety of seasons, uh, the kind of soil types. We just grow about every crop. But there are serious structural challenges there. 
and those challenges need to be addressed and addressed very quickly. Uh, from the point of uh, importing wheat from ship to the mouth, it's uh, now become a problem of plenty. And uh, we have yet to really tackle that challenge. And I can see and I can tell you that uh, it's got to happen there. And if that happens, for India to take up uh, agriculture as a very important economic contributor is a given. The second issue, again, to my mind, as a political science student being in the knowledge-based industry, is really the challenge of our constitutional uh, arrangement. You see, what has happened is that what the, the, the fathers of the Constitution thought in terms of uh, designing it, but when that thought process has now gone, undergone a major change. So every two, three years, we have a change in, we have some elections. And that brings about a stoppage of all development work till those elections are held and till those election results are out. And the process can be anywhere between one to three months. And I think that's a very major impediment. So there is an idea being floated for one election at one time. How, how, how will this happen? Whether it can be constitutionally done, I'm not sure. But I would say that probably, on hindsight, India would have been better off on a presidential form of government. Uh, and I, in fact, I remember asking this question in a, in a meeting to Mr. Vasant Sati. Uh, this is, goes back about uh, 18, 15, 20 years ago. And I said, don't you think so? And I, and I do believe that this is an impediment, the Constitution. The third challenge is really that in terms of our democratic understanding of our rights, vis-a-vis -vis the responsibilities of, as a citizen, I think there is a bit of a mismatch. So that teaching on democracy, of what it truly means, needs to be, uh, at, uh, to be attended to. Uh, particularly when I look at the leadership, uh, sometimes I find, uh, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm making a very controversial statement, but. Sometimes I find that we are picking on very, very small issues. The in-depth understanding of what my country needs, where we need to get together to get things going, to become a world economic power, that's all lost in, I think, uh, very, very small uh, issues. And I wondered if something could be done on that. I mean, I'm being very frank about this. Uh, the fourth point I would make uh, is, a, is, a, is a potential for Indian economy, uh, coming back to the possibilities. I think India is one country which has the best possible options on exploiting the knowledge economy, which is going to be the next round of development base. The base of development will be knowledge. So IoT or whatever you may call it, India has the requisite brain power. Because whatever you want to run, we need to run. And you look world around. I mean, you look in states, you look in England, you look in Europe. It's Indians who are heading all this. And lots of work is being done within the country. So I think, and if you look at the contribution that can make, I see no reason why you should even question the ability of getting to five trillion. And to add to what Rakesh said, and that's where I'll stop, once you get to the five trillion economy, then it's a snowball effect. So from 25, it could be probably another 10 years that you become a uh, 10 trillion economy. Uh, yeah, and thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singhal. I think that's a very important point both of you put together, have uh, distilled. Uh, if you get to five, the snowball to 10 is, you know, I remember uh, Mr. Narayan of, uh, you know, he's talked about in the IT industry that the first billion dollar they took about 18 years to get and the next one billion came in the next 18 months. Exactly. So we are all, we all understand the loading factor of Absolutely. the world. Very insightful <clears throat> points, but I'll get back to you in one question. Uh, the structural reforms that you talked about in agriculture, if you could pinpoint later, I'll come back to that, some specifics on that so that we can carry those little very tag points within the larger frame of structural reforms in agriculture. Sure. Uh, Mr. Raj, you've been a, an, a, an old time in the Horasis, been in a part of the pillar and, uh, of Horasis and been in the industry for such a long time. Uh, apart from the thoughts that the gentlemen have shared, uh, do you think of barriers, mitigation, interventions, uh, and your take on where we are? See, I think, uh, uh, India is 
on a march forward. We have been on a march forward from the year 1992. And predicting the future, one of the very reliable uh, sort of statistical, well proven and established norms is to look into the future, see what's actually happened. Yes, didn't do it. it took 60 years for India after our independence to achieve the one trillion US dollar GDP marks. Okay. All right. So 60 years for the first trillion. That was achieved in 2014. The next trillion came in seven years. Sorry, 2007. So 2014, we became two trillion. Two trillion. All right. Mm -hmm. And the next trillion is going to take only six years. So maybe less, could be even five years, because very soon we are going to be a three trillion economy. By the end of this financial year, we'll probably be very close to that. And certainly by 2020, which is six years from 2014, we'll be a three trillion economy. So that's the direction we are moving. Now, roundabout when Horasis was born, you know, uh, if you look at India's ranking, 1995, we were the 16th largest in the world. Go well, five years later, 2000, we were the 14th largest in the world. You go to 2005, we were the 13th largest in the world. You go to 2010, we became the 10th largest economy in the world. 2015, we are the 8th largest economy in the world. All right? Now, actually, we are already 7th. But by 2020, we will be the fifth largest economy in the world. And these are not my projections. These are projections made by IMF, by World Bank, by PwC, by McKinsey, all of them. Okay? And we'll only be behind <coughs> USA, China, Japan, and Germany. So we are clearly on a march. right? And we have many uh, things happening uh, which are ensuring that this march continues. Firstly is our demographics. We are the youngest country in the world in terms of working population. We also have the largest number of youth in this working force. And this is going to continue right through the next two decades. Right? So India is going to have a clear run for two decades. Now whether we grow at 9% or 8.5% or 8 I mean, that can be the debate. All the structural reforms that we had to do, put in place, uh, President CII has already mentioned, you know, which has made us get onto this momentum. So in addition to demographics, I think the pace of reforms have now picked up under the Modi government phenomenally. Right? And this will continue uh, uh, because now you just have to tweak them. The fundamentals are all there. We are perhaps one of the most liberal uh, economies in terms of foreign direct investment. We have a hang-up of the per past perception, but today we are actually one of the most liberal economies in the world. If you look at urbanization, we are the fastest pace of urbanization in the world today. China was till maybe two years ago, three years ago. Today, India is. And <coughs> as I think McKinsey keeps pointing out, that urbanization is a big driver of growth because it leads to consumption and consumption leads to larger demand for goods and services. And, you know, it's like a snowballing effect. Salil talked about our PARS in, 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 in the IT and what Knowledge today economy. is being the fourth industrial revolution. But look where it began. It began as India 20 years ago embarking on you know, software development, right? And from that stage, today we are the largest back house in the world. China is the largest manufacturing hub of the world. We are the largest back house in the world based on the strength of this knowledge economy which Salil talked about. So we have many, many drivers, and I think uh, one can go on, but perhaps it's good to take a pause now because I know there are many other things you want to touch on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, again, some interesting and very good points here. 
let me play the devil's advocate here and, sure. and ask one or two questions uh, that has come out of the thoughts that you guys have shared. Uh, one is, uh, you know, a lot of people think that in the 92 era when reforms happened the first time, we moved, and this could be a subject very dear to you, that we moved from an agricultural to a service uh, economy, uh, probably missing the boat for manufacturing at that time, the first industrial revolution in the 90s. How good was it where we are because of that is a question I leave to you because uh, th that ties in with the other question that people have, and we, you may want to talk about that, that while we are talking about three trillion and four and five and six trillion, the question that people have is about employment, and there is a sense of a little bit restlessness in the country, whether we, are we generating enough employment to back this whole economic growth, and, and that's very important uh, for us to know. And the third is, uh, do you think India, uh, as an economy of three trillion, would do well, or a five trillion or a 10 trillion would do well to drive itself uh, because of internal consumption? Or, or what is the mix between export and domestic? Because that leads a very clear policy or the lack of it as to why we should be going in that direction. So these are three, four questions, and please choose your own questions and answer. So, so, so if I may pick up the last one, and, and then I'll go to the others. Uh, clearly, with 1.25 billion population, India is a consuming country. And, and, and that's why where you see large corporations, large private sector companies wanting to come into India and partake uh, you know, in the economy, in yeah. the economy and, and be part of that journey. Um, having said that, uh, I think two things which Prime Minister Modi has done exceedingly well. I believe today brand India has moved many notches up. And, and, and with, with a clear vision and leadership which he has provided, is, is brought India to the high table globally, where we sit on policy making now. Earlier, we used to be followers of global policies. Correct. The second is when we look at global conflicts and global resolutions, India sits on the high table. So to me, that is something which is extremely well for brand India. The second thing which he's done exceedingly well is everything which he's talked about is in a mission mode. Make in India, start up India, digital India, stand up India. You can pick up. And, and that has really brought a lot of, uh, if I may say, positive movement within India itself. India today is amongst the top five startups. We are, uh, I think, number three on, on the number largest three, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, startups. That is going to be the power of India. And, and, and on science and technology, I mean, while we can say what we have achieved, my view is in the last 70 years, India has achieved much more uh, in, in that short span, especially when you look at landing on Mars and Mars mission and, and, and you know, nuclear satellite and, and, programs or, or anything, yeah. even in, including the satellite programs. So this is one part of uh, the, the second thing which you talked about employment has been engaging everyone within India itself also. Uh, the problem we have is we only track formal employment. Mm -hmm. Informal employment is not tracked. So let me give you an example. There is a microfinance scheme called Mudra. In the last three years, 120 million people have got about 6 lakh crores of loans, micro loans, which means 120 million became self-employed. The job seekers have become job so creators. creators yeah. That's a large number. One twenty million. It's a large million. number. Uh, now, 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 let me just add to that. Any small micro enterprise you start in India, you will have at least one or two people helping you. Whatever ecosystem, you are doing, yes. depending on what you do, it could be more also. Yes. I'm just saying, pick up one. Another hundred twenty million jobs got created, which which never got tracked. Now, this is a two hundred forty million in the last three years which has not been part of the formal, formal uh, measure. Right? Yeah. Now you can discount by saying, you know, all the, those self-employed, maybe earlier employed, you can discount by 25%, you can, whatever factor you take a discount, huge number of jobs got created. In addition to this, 
you have we have had jobs on drivers on guards security guards those are not tracked so one big thing which the government has done this this february fiscal budget when was presented they have come out with fixed term employment across all sectors which means that now you can get a contract employee employee on a contract and if the employee continues to do well you can keep renewing the contracts or if the contract finishes you can sign off so you, you can have seasonal demand suddenly you need more people now you can't have hiring people for a temporary uh, phase and therefore you go and talk to the outsourcing companies what will this do it will move jobs from the informal sector to the formal sector right because of the notion of contract that you can a notion of contract and yeah. then it will be counted yeah as as a measure formal that... formal employer correct the other thing which is going to be ex extremely good for the msmes they go into ad hoc and casual employees they will start hiring these people without any fear of you know being having to on contract on on, on on contract so that is something which is now moving up i mean if if i see the epf for numbers uh, it's clearly showing month on month there is new employment being generated and by the way under the fixed term contract the employee gets minimum wage all the perks of social security provident fund esi so it comes in the in the formal uh, structure so that's the second uh, question which you talked about the uh, about the jobs on agriculture while uh, uh, salil will uh, be talking about that i am absolutely clear that if we if we are going to look at prime minister's vision of doubling farmers income it will happen only on the back of private sector engagement in the primary agriculture that is extremely important <clears throat> and there for that there are some impediments you can't have more than 17 acres of cultivable land therefore land leasing model should come few states have already passed the legislations the national government has come out with a model uh, land leasing act and i have personally worked with uh, three four state governments where we made sure that the land owner is not alienated out of the ownership of the land so as the contract gets over the land reverts back to the back owner to the and there will be no tenancy right so these are the two big problems yeah. you can be the owner of a, of a property if i am a tenant i don't go out you go to the courts yes so this is part of the legislation the second one is giving farmers the freedom to sell directly and that is one big impediment where private sector is not sort of uh, you know moving in because you have to go through the uh, wholesale markets of the apmcs to the uh, uh, to the middlemen the artias who have the license and uh, and therefore uh, what what we have been pushing at cii is bring perishable produce into the ambit where farmers can sell directly in addition to selling in the wholesale market so give the choice to the farmer so that they can sell to a food processing company an aggregator retailer wholesaler whoever they want to so that's the second uh, uh, you know impediment which we which we see in agriculture and the third is the the retail the the last point of sale uh, which is a catalyst to stitch the entire cold chain which needs to come in so the government has moved on the model land leasing act they have done already come out of the model contract farming act but ultimately the action has to be taken by the state governments and that's where we are now at this point uh, at yeah. this point now we are engaging with uh, so the states the, have to step up and be part of yeah. and align so, themselves so so what this. i have done is i have uh, uh, you know made a suggestion to the niti ayog that they should now start ranking states on ease of doing agriculture like these are doing this points yeah i mean because i believe any competitiveness brings the best out of best uh, you know people so true governments or whoever we may talk about while niti ayog has uh, uh, started this but they only have two or three parameters from my perspective we need to see land uh, reforms i need to see uh, power reforms water management micro irrigation how can we move are these farmers moving from low value to high value crop to increase the farmers income so and and for the first time the country has talked about increasing farmers income until now we have always been talking of increasing productivity yield per uh, per hectare every time the production goes up the prices fall and the farmer suffers and he says why do i need to produce more no so i think it's a it's a dichotomy but my view is that private sector 
has to be brought in. And, and, and I believe the private sector is waiting to uh, step up the game on agriculture. And that ultimately brings up the, the farmer's income as well. Fantastic. Because you bring in best practices, you get in uh, farming, new farming techniques, farm technologies. So, I mean, for example, I, I can share with you, I mean, I, I have an agri and food company. We are engaging with 5,000 farmers today, and I export about 2,000 tons of baby corn to UK. Uh, and that has only happened because we brought them into the, onto the farm to showcase that your production can go up. So instead of doing a wheat rice uh, cycle, they do one wheat rice, one of that. And a high and value. Do, and they do two uh, uh, baby, baby corn. corn, baby corn. <clears throat> Their income levels have mm. gone up from 25 to 30%. And by the way, <clears throat> if you lease the land to the private sector, the farmer incomes goes up by 40% minimum. Without doing, That's without doing farming. Okay. Particularly and, small and, and, and I can very quickly uh, give you the data point on that. Today, the farmer income is on an average 80 to 90,000 rupees per acre per year. So the, the average holding is one hectare, which is two acres. So it's 160,000 to 180,000. The farmer takes all the risk of mother nature, getting finance, getting labor, one field crop, the family is in perpetual debt. The moment they lease land, the land leasing rates are 40,000 to 50,000 rupees per acre per year, which you get in advance, by the way. So if you give two acres of land, so it's 80,000 to 100,000. That's the lease money you got. Then you come and work, because the entire family works in the farming, agriculture. Exactly. The two, if you get two people, 8,500 rupees minimum wage today gives you one lakh four thousand into two, two lakh eight thousand, or two lakh four thousand, whatever the number is, and you add the uh, eighty thousand or hundred thousand. That's the income. Now the farmer sleeps in peace. You don't have to go to the middleman get money, seed, uh, mother nature, market prices crashing, nothing. It goes from one hundred eighty thousand to two hundred eighty odd thousand rupees. That's a 40% jump. That's a 40%. And this is where private sector comes in. And by the way, private sector doesn't have the appetite to take the entire cultivable land or lease. They will create uh, centers of excellence. Around that, thousands of farmers will become your growing partners. And their income levels start going up because they will now go move into high-value crop, which the private sector will want them to grow from there. So that's how I see the agriculture landscape getting better. Very nice. I mean, you know... Uh, in most of these conferences, there's a lot of emphasis on the industry, and agriculture gets little left out, which is what the concern is. So, uh, well, let, is me, let me add to what uh, Rakesh said, and let me clarify this question of ease of doing business. Was the focus for industry? And what now we are saying, ease of doing agriculture. Because what gets measured, gets done. And agriculture is not just about growing, but it is to do a lot with the entire management of infrastructure which supports agriculture is about the management of the supply chain and all those issues so we are working on a on a very detailed document with the niti ayog as uh, rakesh has mentioned so this is one uh, option that we are wanting to uh, want the government to pitch with and get going on it uh, the second point also rakesh touched briefly but let me just uh, further add to that what we are looking to do is that we need to now connect the farmers to the consumers. And the, currently, the entire supply chain is so convoluted, so complicated, and so much uh, 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 pitched against the interests of the farmers because they are middlemen, there are mundies, there are uh, Aggregator, uh, aggregators say. and what have you. So that has to change. And this is where technology can be of a great value. So this ENAM scheme of electronic uh, uh, national agriculture marketing scheme has been recently launched. It is going rather slowly. We need to analyze what, is the, what are the impediments. But that alone will not help. We need to create assaying and quality control checks. We need to create the right warehousing. So a couple of newer schemes have been announced in the budget. And the effort now from the CII angle, from the Agriculture Council, which now I, I head, uh, is to see 
can we prepare a comprehensive policy document which can link this? And I'm very clear that we should never think of launching the entire thing at a national level. We should try and do it in certain experimental basis in a couple of, uh, a couple of if I may say, forward-looking states. If it succeeds, I'm sure it will spread around. The third area which I think which is critical now for India is to look at agriculture production forecasting as well as agriculture markets survey. Again here we have done some work in surveying the markets which are the markets for example where apples sell, where bananas are required and so on and so forth. Essentially the problem of supply and demand is to what do we do in industry? Our best effort is to match the supply to demand and to match the demand to supply. So what is right now happening in India is that there is this big mismatch. So we got to do this agriculture forecasting. Now technologies are available uh, where you can uh, forecast by uh, looking at, uh, by looking at, uh, was by, by, by satellites and other facilities. So this is one thing we will be able to do. And, uh, we, and, and market surveys are again very easily uh, possible because there is a lot of data available. So I think if over a period of time we can put that, and America therefore is so successful in agriculture. They have a very fairly accurate, almost 95% accurate agriculture production forecasting and agriculture market demand. So they would tell the farmers don't grow corn this year or don't grow soya beans this year or don't grow this, that and the other. And I think we've got to get there. All these issues are in a time frame of, I would believe, five to ten years, if not more. And the problem that has happened now is that we want it yesterday. So yeah. there would be pain. Uh, there would be pain in the interim, but the gain is for sure. My last comment on that question of employment. I think we need to understand that today manufacturing is no more a standalone business. I do not know of any business, or I would say yes, of course there would be, but there are most of the businesses today to become more customer friendly have to connect a sense of servicing to what they do. Like if I was selling pesticides through my distributors, now I'm looking at seeing can I apply to the farmers because they find it a big job to correctly make the dosage, correctly forecast the pest, correctly apply and we say look if I if I charge you rupees 100 per acre to undertake the pest control services we are seeing a tremendous response we have already seen it in harvesting we are seeing it in sowing and a lot of services are getting connected to a lot of businesses even equipment suppliers say if you have a boiler making he said, we'll not only give you the boiler but we will install it for you we'll come and maintain it for you we will come and uh, see that you get the regulatory approvals so now services are becoming an integral part of manufacturing. And look, it's very simple mathematics. If the economy will grow, all this has to grow. And if this has to grow, it needs people. Again, we need to be a little patient and we'll be there. Good. Uh, very good points. That, you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged with the insights of many of these points that you gentlemen have brought out that generally gets lost in a larger forum because these are fine details that many of us are not aware and, and the media is also not fully aware of what's going on. So it's very important to take it to the crowd and see this is what is being done. And I know that, you know, I, I call it that we are rebooting. India is rebooting itself in the last few years, you know, the, the done of what we did, it did not do in the past 70 years. Um, Rajiv Kaul, one quick question on you. We've addressed many of these issues. Uh, what would be your thoughts in this growth phase of India, 5 trillion and 10 trillion, and the role of the SME sector uh, in all this, whether they are in services, whether they are in manufacturing, because they, they, they seem to carry a lot of burden in terms of employment and GDP as well. Uh, yeah, actually, it's the SMEs which are driving the growth. And whether it's services or manufacturing, it is SMEs which are driving the substantive growth. Whether it's the domestic economy, whether it's exports, it's the SMEs who are driving this growth. The startups, 
38,000 that he, we have today, the 100,000 startups that we're going to have uh, in the year 2025, they are going to create a direct employment for three, over 3 million people. Right? But that will be the formal economy. You know, there's a huge amount of informal economy, particularly in the agriculture sector. You know, I don't know, I think maybe it's around 500 million people who are employed informally in the agri sector, which are not counted. But when you look at job growth and job creation, I think there are certain fundamental yardsticks by which one can measure it. One is law and order. One is how unhappy the youth is. Uh, how ambitious is the youth? You know, these are, these, it's the youth which is driving India. And they're not driving it down. You know, it's, it's not that, it's not an Arab Spring happening in India. It's the reverse. They're all being brought together to create a new India, a vibrant India, a strong India. And perhaps on a conclusion note, because I know we are running out of time, I would say, why do you look at India just as a 10 trillion? Why stop there? So many people have forecast that by 2030, India is going to be a $19 trillion economy. China will be 38 that time. USA will be $23 trillion. And this is not in purchasing power parity. This is in nominal, nominal GDP. GDP terms. If you look at it in purchasing power parity, oh, yeah. we are already number three. right? And we'll become number two. China is already number one in terms of purchasing power parity. This is the age of Asia. It's the century of Asia. And India has now joined China's hands in leading the global demand. Right. I think that's, that's the future of India. And it's strong and vibrant. Thank you. I mean, you know, I think uh, this, is, it, this is the spirit of leadership and a positive spin that the industry leaders and policymakers bring and the message out there is very clear. Everyone's working towards it. We are, we are going to be ever forward. Uh, uh, it's not what you hear sometimes, doomsday prophecy, that, that's lurking in the corner. Everything is Quite we are fixing opposite. things. We are Quite making it transparent, compliant. Yeah. The industry is working, the agriculture, all of this. So I, I feel very, very positive that uh, the path, the original subject why we are all together is about the 5 and 10 trillion. I think we are on our target to not only meet, but to surpass that, probably in lesser time period than what others have talked about. And yes, there would be things that may take a little longer, but we are fixing things in a more structural way for all years to come. And our the younger generation should feel positive that... You know, uh, and in a democratic fashion. In a democratic in fashion. In a large which is democracy, very the world's largest makes, democracy. Yeah, all the more tough. Yes, because we sit here and we talk about anything that the government has not done also with same zeal and fervor and transparency as anyone else. So thank you for uh, giving but, us but your valuable you, time. If I sure. may just add one last point, sure. right, because I think it's extremely important. Uh, I believe time has come when industry needs to engage with academia more than what we have been doing. And let me tell you why. Every five years, there are technology disruptions happening in the world. Today, we are preparing our children for jobs and future. The time has come when we need to prepare our children for future of jobs. The job profile is changing every five years, exactly. every three years. And therefore, industry academia linkages is going to be extremely important. Industry need to be sitting across the table, curriculum change, internships, inputs of what, is, what, what are the requirements in the next three to five years. By the same yardstick, academia needs to be um, you know, comfortable with changes, absorbing and, and, and listening to the, what the industry wants. Because right. it, it's been a problem on both sides. both sides. And if we are saying India has to be amongst the top three economies, if we are saying India has to lead the new age economies and new age technologies, then we have to prepare our children. And therefore, higher educational institutions will have to now get into a change of mindset. So 
just with that note. Very good I, point. I, I, I think this I think is a very, thank you again, and very insightful points. Thank you for giving us your time and your thoughts. Pleasure. And let's go and enjoy some hospitality of Malaga here. <laughs> thank you once again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.